different places across across the world. So that's that's really exciting for us. Thank you for for signing up and and for being here. Um, so today we'd like to uh, launch a collection called uh, the Ethics of Animal Shelters, which was published by uh, Oxford University Press earlier this year. And so this this collection was co-edited by Valerie Zhu, Angie Pepper, both also on the call, and myself. And uh, as we'll explain a bit more um, later on, this this book is the outcome of a collaboration between uh, a group of philosophers and animal ethicists, uh, several of whom are on this call um, as well, and the Montreal SPCA, who's also represented here on the Zoom call by um, Zofie Gaillard. And what we'd like to uh, do to today is really just sort of share the project with a wider range of people, introduce uh, the project and tell you a bit more about what we did. Uh, but we'd also like the opportunity to take uh, stock of what we've done uh, and think a bit more about what the project has, has achieved, but also what its limitations might have been and what um, next steps might be. So we're really excited that we have um, several commentators here today who will give us their feedback and their insight, insights and their comments on the book from uh, very different uh, perspectives. So we're going to introduce everyone in a moment. Uh, but before we go into this, I'd just like to um, briefly acknowledge that even though we're all online today, most of this project that we're talking about today took place uh, in Montreal, uh, which is unceded uh, indigenous territory. So the island of Montreal is the traditional territory of the Ganyangehaga. And in the language of the Ganyangehaga, Montreal is known as Trichage, and the island has historically served as a meeting place for other indigenous nations. And as researchers in environmental and animal ethics, uh, we'd also like to recognize the role of indigenous nations in protecting the land as well as the animals and plants that inhabit it. So our plan for today is to, once we finish the, the welcome introduction, um, to start with some commentaries. So the first person speaking will be uh, Sigeya, who is now the uh, Director of Animal Advocacy and Legal and Government Affairs at the Montreal SPCA, but who also uh, for the past, uh, I think, almost a year, uh, was the Interim Ex Executive Director at the Montreal SPCA. We'll also hear from uh, Karen Houston from the Royal Veterinary College, the University of London and the University of Sussex. And then we'll have a we'll have a quick break, um, and then we'll hear from two more commentators: Jessica Dutoy from Western University of uh, Ontario, and then Laurie Groon from Western University, just uh, south of the border. Uh, we also want to make time to allow contributors who um, wrote chapters and contributed to the book to respond. So I can't see uh, who's on the call right now, but I think we have Sue Donaldson. François Jacquet, uh, Nicolas Delon, and uh, Frédéric Coutet-Boudreau on the call. I think it might maybe also Angela Martin, I'm not entirely sure, um, but we'll we'll introduce uh, those people later on um, when I can see who's there. Uh, we also want to make space for anyone in the audience to raise questions um, and then we'll uh, draw everything to a close towards the end. So we had originally set aside three hours for this event. Uh, but we may not need all this time, but we'd like to have enough room for some breaks uh, and also some general in informal discussion. Okay, so I'm going to just say a little bit more about how this uh, project came about. So this has really been a long time in the making. Um, back in 2017, um, Elise Desunier, who was then the director of the SPCA, chatted to some of us and mentioned how uh, many difficult um, ethical challenges uh, she and other people at the SPCA encountered in their day-to-day -day work and um, sort of explained that there was actually very little guidance on how these challenges might be approached or even time to to think through these issues. And that's when the idea of having a more sustained engagement with these issues came about, right? The idea that we could think about these questions from an animal ethics um, perspective. 
And we then slowly developed a plan on how philosophers and ethicists might help uh, think through and address these problems. And we managed to get some funding from uh, Shirk to help us get the um, project off the ground. And so one thing that we quickly realized is that not only is the riddle's guidance on these ethical issues, but also when it exists, it often comes from, or it often works with very different very problematic assumptions when it comes to the status of animals. So for instance, that there's nothing wrong with uh, killing animals for food or that companion animals have owners um, who get to make decisions about their animals' lives. So one aim that we had for our project was precisely to work with a more ambitious uh, ethical framework that um, takes as a starting point that non-human animals' moral standing is much more significant than that. And that, of course, must shape what happens in animal shelters and organizations such as the Montreal SPCA. And we'll say more a bit, a bit more about the specifics of that framework uh, in a minute. Now, one important aspect of the project was uh, to do with the methodology. Um, so, and if you can, yeah, thank you. So this was, our idea was that we wanted the project to be driven by uh, shelter workers' own insights into problems that they were facing and the constraints within which they operate. So we really wanted the starting point to be kind of practitioners' perspectives on their work and the ethical problems that they were dealing with, right? rather than having ethicists who are kind of removed and in a sense detached from the actual work to be imposing their own understanding of what the ethical issues would be. So to kind of help with this, we had several uh, meetings with staff at the Montreal SPCA over the course of several months. And during these meetings, SPCA staff shared with us the, the, the difficult dilemmas that they were facing. So this helped us to see many common issues arising across the organization, but also that there were many issues that uh, arose within more specific departments, or for instance, where people working in the shelter branch might have a different perspective or a different set of problems or concerns than people working in the part of the organization that investigates breaches of animal welfare legislation. And we really wanted to hear from, from staff what they thought the most pressing issues were or the most urgent problems, rather than having us impose um, a view about the relative urgency or importance of different question, questions. So going into this, we, we were kind of, we already assumed that the, one of the kind of um, characteristics of, of this work would be that there are never enough resources um, to help deal with the problems um, that the organization was facing, but it was important for us to hear from shelter staff themselves about how they perceived the constraints that they were operating in and how they were responding to them. And we also learned a lot about the different psychological uh, and emotional effects that some of these issues have on people who work in the shelter. And the emotional burden that comes with this kind of work is something that we really uh, tried to take into account very explicitly as we developed our recommendations because it's such a central aspect of what it's like uh, to work in this environment. Okay, so I'm, I'm handing over to Andy to uh, say a bit more about various other aspects of the project. Uh, yeah, you are handing over to me. I'm just trying to operate this PowerPoint. Um, okay. Um, so, as Kristen said, it was like very important um, to us that we weren't imposing too much of our own kind of commitments uh, on uh, employees of the Montreal SPCA and the institution, the organization itself. And so, the first there were two, I guess, main aims in those initial discussions. Um, the first was to sort of establish the ethical framework, which would then um, provide us with an, uh, a way of answering the, the various challenges that staff uh, identified. So the ethical framework that we um, explicated came from the Montreal SPCA's uh, public commitments, so from its mission statements and its uh, public facing um, policies. And I'm just going to set it out so that you have an idea of what it was, the, the, the framework that we were kind of endorsing uh, and using to answer the various challenges that they, uh, um, they communicated to us. So 
the framework has several commitments and the first is that there's a recognition that animals matter for their own sakes irrespective of whether or not they may bring benefit to humans the second is that there's a recognition of the importance of all sentient beings including those who live in farms factories and laboratories in our towns and cities and in the wild the third is that there's a recognition of the value of animals lives and the importance of protecting their lives and well-being more generally the fourth is that there's a recognition that animals have morally significant capacities for agency. Uh, the fifth is that the rec there's a recognition that animals are entitled to relationships with humans that are characterized by care and respect. And then lastly, there's a recognition that humans have duties of protection towards animals. And these are quite ambitious um, commitments. But as I said, and I think this is important, these are commitments which are uh, expressed um, in the Montreal SPCA's own mission statement and supporting policies. And it's from this perspective um, that we set about trying to address the various challenges that were identified by uh, shelter staff. And so there are lots of questions that we have looked at and that are covered in the book, but here's a kind of a, a sample of them to give you a sense of some of the key issues that we that we um, were able to sort of tease out of uh, the various conversations that we had with shelter uh, employees. So the first question is, how should the SPCA talk about animals? So how should it refer to animal companions? Should it be talking about pets and ownership? Um, questions around how we talk about meat um, and how we talk about animals who are farmed. What should shelter residents be fed? Um, and so one of the kind of core uh, sources of disagreement um, and a kind of core worry was around um, the ethics of feeding shelter residents the bodies of other animals um, when there's an express commitment to the interests of all sentient animals. Is it ethical to terminate healthy animal pregnancies, um, especially when you're kind of um, here the concern is around overpopulation in shelters and sort of a worry about uh, whether you've got space to bring into existence uh, more animals in need. Is palliative care something the SPCA should invest resources in? So should the SPCA be investing resources in animals um, who are kind of at the end of their life um, when there are so many animals who are in need of resources and are not at the end of their life? Is killing animals who need significant resources to be rehomed morally permissible? So animals who um, may have medical conditions which are time um, uh, intensive so it takes a long time to treat them or perhaps uh, financially expensive to treat um, or perhaps they're animals who have um, particular kind of characteristics which make them difficult to rehome. Should every effort be made to rehome community cats or should they be trapped, neutered and released? So these are questions around uh, animals, so cats in particular, who are brought to the shelter, um, who have been living in the community or who are stray, and what should the um, shelter do with those animals? How demanding should the adoption process be? So what kinds of requirements should there be for those looking to adopt shelter animals? And how should the SPCA interact with the animal agriculture industry? Um, so concerns here around um, in being seen to endorse problematic practices or practices which are exploiting uh, animals. So these are just some of the uh, questions that shelter staff raised in conversation with us. And so the overall output of this project um, is the book, uh, which we are obviously launching. Um, and so what we essentially did and how the book is broke down is you have part one in which we offer some guidelines and recommendations which address those central questions that were raised um, by staff and importantly the guidelines and recommendations are very much tailored to the specific needs of the Montreal um, SPCA and so they're very much shaped by the conversations that we had with with staff um, so while we think that many of the um the issues that we address will be 
experienced by other uh, animal protection organizations. There will be some, uh, obviously, that are kind of unique to the Montreal SPCA, and there will be some um, that we have overlooked, and I'll come back up to that in a second. Um, so the guidelines and recommendations, the, they're basically structured in the following way. So we um, clarify the particular problem that's been identified. And then we offer a recommendation and then we offer a reasoned defense of that recommendation. Um, and then, so that's how the guidelines are structured. And then part two of the book uh, is a series of philosophical chapters, which really um, give a much more detailed examination and defense of some of those recommendations and some of the issues and themes that come up in the guidelines. So, there we are kind of as philosophers really getting to uh, the foundational conceptual and normative questions um, that are, you know, we're trying to figure out a way um, of answering these important challenges, but in a much more uh, detailed, uh, yeah, in a much more detailed way that we could possibly do in the guidelines. So that's roughly how the book is structured. In terms of themes for those kind of philosophical chapters, um, I think that there are two main themes that sort of emerge out of our um, kind of independent uh, inquiries into these issues. The first is that there's a real recognition that shelters are operating in non-ideal conditions. And so many of the contributors are focused on non-ideal theory. So we're trying to work out what shelter workers ought to be doing um, in, in context where mor like the morally perfect action is just not available, right? You can't do what justice requires um, and you can't do what perfect morality requires. But what we can do is think about what the um, next best um, possible uh, action is. And so there's a lot of focus on um, trying to figure out what shelter workers um, ought to do in the non-ideal conditions in which they find themselves. That said, right, we don't want to be too pessimistic. Um, a lot of the shelter workers that we spoke with um, expressed sort of general sense of frustration um, and upset about the tragic choices that they were often forced to, um, to that they were often forced to face and difficult decisions that they were uh, that were often um, kind of forced to make. And so one thing that is important both in the chapters, in some of the chapters, but also in the guidelines is this idea that actually shelters can play a really important role in bringing about a better world for animals. And so some of the contributions are more positive. Uh, they focus more on what the place of shelters, um, what, what sh the place of shelters would be in a more just world um, for animals and thinking about how shelters might and shelter workers might help us to get there. And then lastly, a kind of common theme that came up in the philosophical chapters um, and that we have tried to um, give some guidance on in the recommendations is this idea of disagreement um, and kind of negotiation. So disagreement in this area is rife. Um, there is disagreement between employees there's disagreement between different departments of uh, organizations like the SPCA. There's disagreements within the sheltering community. There's disagreements um, between those in power uh, and shelter um, animal protection organizations. So there's disagree disagreement abounds. And disagreement is really burdensome, um, very burdensome for those people who are tasked with what is already a very difficult job. And so one of the things that kind of comes out in the philosophical chapters, but also uh, in the guidelines, is ways of managing that disagreement um, so that it's not so burdensome for shelter workers. And that might be through devising kind of formal mechanisms, but it also from a philosophical perspective is about showing that certain positions are just ruled out. Um, and that there should not really be, they're, they're things that we can no longer have a reasonable disagreement over. Um, and I think that that's particularly useful or could be particularly useful um, for those who are working in animal protection organisations. <laughs>
Okay, so just very briefly on the limitations of the project, and I'm sure our commentators will have more to say on this. Um, so context is everything. Um, the, the environment um, that the Montreal West PCA finds itself in uh, means that it has unique problems uh, that won't be problems for animal protection organisations or animal shelters elsewhere. So if you think that you know, the Montreal winters are very, very cold, for example, and the summers are very hot, um, that's not going to be true of sheltering organisations in, in the UK. Um, so whilst, as I said at the start, the recommendations that we have put forward in the book um, are tailored to the kind of the needs and the interests of the staff at the Montreal uh, SPCA, but hopefully a lot of what we say is translatable or translatable with modification um, to uh, to other organisations in um, different um, locations. Um, but again, I think that you know this is a limit of the project um, that it is only kind of covering one organisation, but you can only you can't do too much. Um, so yeah. Uh, I don't know why that came second, but we'll go there. Um, so the second limitation um, is that there's a certain the the what we've already um, the guidelines that we've specified in the book. Some of those have already kind of ceased to be relevant, right? And some things that are now really pressing for the organisation don't get in there. And the main reason for this is that shelters are forced to operate in ever-changing circumstances. They are subject to internal changes. So there might be a change in personnel or the kind of man management structure or the funding that's available to them, but they're also subject to external um, changes and factors. So there might be developments in technology, uh, in medicine, uh, there might be a change in the political climate. So all of those things, mean that shelters have to be constantly adapting um, their policies in order to do the best work that they can in the situation that they find themselves. And so one of the limitations is that, you know, whilst we are committed to the things that we say, we recognise that the recommendations themselves have to be adaptable to these ever-changing circumstances. And then lastly, um, the guidelines are limited in part as a result of the methodology. So by kind of asking a select group of employees, the range of issues that they brought to light is limited by their own experience. Um, and so there may have been issues that you know, didn't come to light partly because they didn't tell us about them, but also just because they as a group did not experience them. So again, there are, we think probably, and you know, as as has since happened, many issues that are not addressed um, that stand in need of being addressed. And so, whilst these are limitations of the project, I think that um, it's worth also seeing them as opportunities um, and opportunities to do more uh, research in this area. Um, before I move on, Kristin, have you got anything to add? Okay. Um, okay. So with that, hopefully that's given you a brief um, summary of what it is that we are up to in the project and what the book is about. And so now we're going to turn to our commentators and see what they made of it. So I think we're going to start with Sophie. Thank you, Angie and Kristen, for that great introduction. Uh, I'm going to begin with just uh, giving you a little bit of a sense of our perspective as the shelter who uh, participated in the research project on the context uh, and the, the sort of justification in our eyes for, for this research project and for embarking in it. Um, because as was mentioned already by Kristen and Angie, uh, facing ethical dilemmas and making very difficult decisions and life and death decisions are part of everyday life in shelters. And I can tell you from being at the Montreal SPCA for 10 years now, we are no exception. This is just an everyday occurrence uh, for our staff. And these challenges are even more complex to navigate when resources are strained uh, due to uh, the realities of uh, 
of the sheltering context, but also the larger uh, situation and in terms of funding, a very competitive job market and uncertain economy. And just to, to be very pragmatic uh, for a second, um, in terms of the trends we've been seeing, um, in terms of animal intakes in shelters across the country, uh, we have been seeing, there was a general tendency for intake numbers to be decreasing over the past decade, uh, but all that stopped in 2022 last year where we saw the numbers increase again. And this year we are faced with even higher numbers uh, than last year. So the trend seems to be going back up, unfortunately, in terms of animal intakes. Just to give you a sense, uh, since the beginning of this year, so January 2023, uh, our surrender rates are 20% higher than last year. So this is significant, puts even a bigger strain on our resources, makes decision making even more difficult. Um, and then add to that the job market, which is so difficult for us to be competitive in currently, um, and the economic uncertainty uh, donations are more difficult to obtain. Um, and just inflation is also causing a lot of animal surrenders uh, to because people can't afford veterinary care, etc. So that's the, the sad reality for us at the shelter um, and just exacerbates the difficulty of making uh, these decisions that we're faced with on a daily basis. Um, another element is that these issues often go to the very heart of the values of a shelter and the values of its staff, because as you can imagine, people who are willing to put up with our lower salaries are people who are extremely dedicated um, and who deeply, deeply care about animals. Um, so this isn't just a clock in, clock out type of job. People care um, and people have opinions. Um, and so these issues can become very thorny, can even become conflictual. Um, and if I take just the example of our organization, uh, there's several ethical dilemmas that have persisted for years at RSPCA, uh, for example, regarding how to make euthanasia, euthanasia decisions uh, or end of life decisions uh, regarding intake policies. So, you know, on what basis do we um, take in animals at the shelter or not? Um, and adoption policies and different staff members have very opposite views on some of these issues. Um, and we've had no real clear way of, um, of resolving this and coming to some type of consensus. Um, so it can get very conflictual. Um, so this research project was a great opportunity uh, first to sort of openly discuss these issues we face, um, which we often don't have time to do. And the, the uh, the emotions tend to get kind of buried in people's, uh, people's in, the, in our staff members. So this was really a forum to be able to express all this difficulty that people have to grapple with on a, on a daily basis. So I would say there was even some like therapeutic value for a lot of our staff members who were able to just express to, uh, to the researchers what they deal with on a daily basis. But also, of course, ultimately, um, the value for us in this project was to receive some kind of external guidance on how to navigate these daily challenges. Um, so we're really grateful to have been able to participate in the project and to have these guidelines that are really tailored actually to the reality of our shelter and our, our organization uh, that does more than just sheltering, but also engages in law enforcement and advocacy work and all these different aspects. Um, and you know, we're very hopeful that this will help us actually uh, concretely navigate some of these issues. Um, turning now to more the content of the guidelines themselves, um, several of the issues that were raised in the guidelines actually uh, correspond to areas that we're actively reflecting on, um, you know, these big questions for us in terms of our identity and, you know, where to put our focus, our energy, for example, our role in law enforcement or our, our relationship with animal use industries. Uh, so it was really interesting to see uh, that, you know, external researchers and ethicists um, also saw these areas uh, the same way we do as very thorny, very, um, you know, very difficult to strike the right balance between being strategic, but yet tr staying true to our values. Um, so it gave a lot of legitimacy to some of these big questions that we've been grappling with um, as an organization. Um, some elements of the guidelines, though they made sense in the abstract or from an ethical perspective, uh, were to a certain extent, I would say, 
disconnected to a certain degree from sort of the pragmatic uh, on the ground reality of working at the shelter. Um, the prime example, I think for me is the plant-based food for, for shelter dogs, which is certainly absolutely coherent with our stated values, uh, but currently not practical in the cir current circumstances where the food we serve to our, our uh, dogs at the shelter um, are donated largely uh, by large pet food companies with whom we have partnerships. Um, and unfortunately the vegan dog food uh, market is still a little bit too small to be able to offer these hu huge amounts of donated food. Um, so that's something that I think we're unfortunately um, tributary to how the market evolves in that respect and perhaps cultivated meat will be an interesting new uh, development for shelter animals as well. Um, but yeah, that's something that seems a little bit more difficult to achieve. And then some of the elements of the guidelines uh, were things that we hadn't actually ever really thought about putting in place, but which uh, we found were very useful ideas and which we are now working on putting in place. Uh, the example, um, the foremost example being the ethics board, the recommendation to put in place this ethics board that is um, you know, partially composed by staff and by external uh, external people as well uh, to provide guidance to the organization and to the board in terms of ethical dilemmas. Uh, we think that that's a really excellent idea and we're actually working on putting it in place uh, at our SPCA. Um, so that's something that's very promising uh, to us. So that's sort of my my quick uh, overview of how we uh, we perceive the project and uh, the, the guidelines. Thanks, Sophie. Um, Karen? Hello, can you all hear me okay? Marvellous, great. Um, yeah, hi everyone. It's so brilliant to see so many people turning up to this event, I think. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of a a thing about who I am and, and, and sort of how I came to this. I was very lucky to, to meet Angie at a conference a few years ago and we got talking about this project and um, that's sort of how she got to know um, that I might be interested in coming along today. But my background really stems from being someone much more at the practical end of the spectrum of this. So I was a clinical vet in the sort of clinical veterinary industry for nigh on 10 years. But since 2009, I worked almost exclusively within the, U in the UK shelter animal welfare industry, which is an industry here, which I'll give a wee overview of. I've also done quite a lot of work on international and local, both TNR and CNVR, so dog and cat population control management. I've worked in that quite a lot in quite a number of programs in numerous countries. Um, and as such, as sort of coming from this more sort of practical perspective, I'm probably going to limit my commentary to the recommendations, the first half of the book, the sort of practical down, down on the farm kind of stuff, um, all of which I found absolutely brilliant. And I think but because this um, the book was based on Montreal and the North American perspective, and one thing we know in the shelter industry as is that the North American shelter industry is quite different to the UK shelter and animal charity industry um, or sector. So I thought for those of you who are in the North American land, I might give a bit of an overview of how things work here in the UK just to get a bit of a lie of the land, which is quite helpful because um, as Angie said, context is everything. Um, and the context of how these organizations work can be quite different and where they are positioned. So when I mean, the UK has, has a whole animal charity industry, as I say, and that's quite an exciting thing. You might've picked up, I'm not from the UK. I've got a Kiwi accent. I come from New Zealand where there isn't, or well, certainly when I was a clinical vet there, there wasn't an animal charity or a sheltering industry. There were some shelters, there's an SPCA, there's a few bits and bobs, nothing like what there is here in the UK. So in the UK, we are awash with animal organizations and with support, and it's, it's an amazing thing. We've got the RSPCA, of course, the original. They've been around for 200 years next year. It's their 200 year anniversary. And when you put that into context, when we think about legislation, just for example, it's quite an extraordinary achievement that we have had animal protection and animal protection organization existing for 200 years. We've also got um, species specific charities that are very large with large amounts of sheltering and large amounts of money. And that's Cats Protection and Dogs Trust are two of the main ones there. And as I say, they're species specific. There's the Mayhew's been around. All of these have been around for around a hundred years as well. Blue Cross and um, PDSA also um, are two organizations that provide veterinary care 
Um, so that both charities that provide veterinary care as well. And we have Battersea too, which has only got a couple of sites, but um, has quite a, I'll mention Battersea Dogs and Cats Home a few times because they have quite a similar mandate to the Montreal situation in, in certain areas. Add to those big guns, <laughs> we also have a plethora of independents, independent charities, everywhere every county is going to have their own you know kent labrador rescue for example they're everywhere and they can be registered as charities and operate as such they can be breed um, species specific they can be rescue and rehoming they can be rehabilitation and sanctuary organizations they can be anything one important thing about animal charities within the uk context is there is no licensing so there is no oversight to these organizations what they have to be is registered charities and that means they have a registration with an organ a governmental organization called the charity commission and the charity commission are the, are the sort of governmental oversight of things and with the charity commission you register what your mission is or the articles of association it's called so you say this is what we do and this is what we'll spend our charitable money on and the charity commission exists to check up on that if the money has been spent elsewhere on things that aren't part of those articles of association you're in trouble however because there is this plethora of independence and there's lots of as you can imagine big variety in standards and how people do things there's an overarching organization called ADCH or the Association of Dogs and Cats Homes, and they have come together as like an umbrella organization to try and promote best practice across the organizations. They're a member organization, so charities can join into them. And it's a way of trying to improve practice across all of these charities and, and spread information and also to a degree self-license or self-police the, the area. So that's that's kind of a bit of an idea, but one thing I'm quite a fan of talking about in the UK, one strength I see in, in the way the organisations work in this country is that they fit together like a charity jigsaw. They do not all do the same thing. They do not all hold the same ethical perspectives or the same ethical beliefs. They don't all step on each other's toes. And I see that as a strength. And we're going to come back to this idea of the charity jigsaw in a, in a little bit. But it's, it's a good thing to have multiple functions within the charity space for a couple of reasons. They are all, all of them are publicly funded, or not public, but they're funded by the public, by public donation, as in there is no governmental funding for any of these organizations. Hence, they're all out there fundraising and competing for the same money from the same audience, basically. But if they have slightly different um, perspectives, if they have slightly different attitudes to what they do, that can be quite helpful because it can help people to adjust and to donate their money to the organization whose beliefs and perspectives and ideas that they align most with. And that can be powerful. It also means it's good for staff and for volunteers. A lot of these organizations run volunteers too. Because again, as, as um, from the descriptions from Angie and, and Sophie, we could hear that within the staff, even at the Montreal SPCA, there was a huge variety in attitude um, amongst the staff and volunteers that, that are involved in that organization as to what they think is the right thing to do. And that, of course, goes across all the organizations here too. And what I'm quite passionate about is that's okay, but what you've got to do is find the organization that fits you, yeah? And rather than assuming that every organization is going to have the same perspective. It also means that things don't get missed. So one organization, an excellent um, example is open, open admissions policies. So Montreal obviously have an open admissions policy. They have a, a mandate where they can't turn animals away. Um, Battersea, Dogs and Cats Home here, works in exactly the same way. That's what's registered with the Charity Commission. They cannot turn a needy animal away. When you can't turn an animal away, that creates significant resource pressure. Whereas other organizations can take a different stance. They can say, we will not euthanize animals that aren't suffering, or we will only euthanize on veterinary advice, for example, or we will rehome everything that we can. If you say that, then you're gonna to have to turn some animals away because of resource. So those two jig parts of the jigsaw can fit well together. But what I think is important is that conflict that Sophie mentioned, 
the idea that it's acceptable to have organizations have different perspectives and different views on on what is the appropriate way to act and be be accepting of that because actually there is power in them fitting together and doing slightly different things Another thing about charities in this country is in general, especially with the big ones anyway, they are all very much grounded in science and evidence base of what they do. So the RSPCA have operated a scientific department for forever, um, who've, who've put out their own research, plus um, uh, sort of going through existing research to come up with good policy statements. Dogs Trust and Cats Protection, as I say, the big um, species specific organizations also run whole research departments. Dogs Trust is huge. Um, they're looking at lots of human animal interaction research, um, socialization behavior, all sorts of different research that they're you know, fundamental research that they are producing themselves. Cats Protection are doing much the same. Um, they've been looking at stuff, again, to do with human animal interactions, mostly around TNR and dealing with community cats and how to engage communities in that. But they're also looking at something really important, which I will come back to, but welfare assessment. So looking at the welfare of animals within shelter and you know, producing their own research programs around these things. So it's a really important aspect of the big charities here is that re not necessarily research themselves, but being based in evidence is a really crucial part of what they do. As I say, there's a lot of fundraising that has to go on and fundraising is big business. We do apparently live in a country full of animal lovers, um, as the UK is very, you know, they love to say that. Um, and yes, they do give huge amounts. We are talking about a lot of money flowing through charitable organisations in this country. Saying that, um, I think both Kristen and Sophie said it in the introductions there, it is a, just a ground part of everything to do with animal charities, especially in shelter, is that you never have enough resource. It just, it's never going to happen. You will always have a bigger need than your resource allows, whether that's money, space, people, emotion, whatever the resource is. So despite there being many millions floating around, it's, it's still the need is always greater. We do have a slightly, I think for me, a surprisingly litigious <laughs> or, um, population here. So it's not uncommon for there to be legal problems for charities. Um, I think especially the big charities can fall into part of the sort of populist movement against authority. Um, They're sometimes seen as large, rich and faceless. The RSPCA can be hampered by the fact that they have uniforms um, within their inspectorate and there can be a, a popular view of these organisations as somehow being part of authority or funded by the government erroneously. And that, um, that othering of the organisations can be really problematic, especially when coupled here with, and I hope for wherever you are, this isn't the case for you, but we have a media industry here is sort of predicated on, on tabloids and tabloids do quite like to go against authority figures. And unfortunately here, charities can fall into that sometimes and they have had severe impacts by falling foul of the tabloids um, who, who like to sort of poke, poke at, the, at the bear in that way. And that can be really, really difficult and has had in some cases really catastrophic effects. So it's, it becomes relevant when we talk about the positioning of an organization because PR is king. It is really important to get your PR right and what the public view of you is right because as someone very smart said to me, if there's no money, there's no welfare. The money's got to come in. That's really crucial. And another probably really important aspect of um, UK shelters versus the, the North American situation is the terminology around no kill is, is not really used. And that's probably in part because in the main, they are all what North America would term no kill. The, you know, the, the euthanasia or killing rates in this country are generally very, very much lower. Um, they are obviously higher in those places that operate open admissions where those, those extra pressures come on. But um, there, was, there was a couple of points, yeah, I'll, sort of, I'll dive into a few points around the book. Um, there was one point that was raised, um, just a small point, but as, as the sort of veterinary person here, I'll, I'll pick it up. Um, the authors were right that there is more and more, thank goodness, literature and guidance aimed at the vet profession around animal ethics and veterinary ethics. And that's marvellous. That's what my current job is. But that guidance, even coming from our, in this country, our Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons, it doesn't ever speak to this, this sector. There's never any discussion of shelters and the, the peculiarities of, of the ethics within those. Um, 
shelter medicine as a veterinary discipline is emerging. The term shelter medicine, it's not my favorite. It's got the word medicine in it, which limits it, I think, to being somehow just a clinical thing. Um, it's the terminology that was used in North America, and we've co-opted it over here too. We're just borrowing it and running with it. But I would like to always point out that shelter medicine is a much bigger kettle of fish than just the clinical. Yes, there's a lot of very fascinating and very important clinical aspects to shelters, um, but really it's about the entire aspect of population. It involves human animal interaction, it involves understanding population dynamics, and it involves an awful lot of things. One thing it does involve and that we talk about a lot here within the shelter world is something called the prag what we call the pragmatic approach or what we had called the pragmatic approach. And that's the idea of, of how we medically treat animals in these contexts. And that is the idea of it's quite context specific, how we make decisions about their care, you know, all the way up to euthanasia, then those decisions are going to be different because they are in a different context than they are when they are owned or in a home or living in a different life. And that the context under which an animal is will have a big impact on the medical decisions that we're going to make about it. I say we used to talk about it as pragmatic approach, and that's, that was the term I used to use. Uh, I can direct you to a really nice paper that approaches the same concept, not necessarily in the shelter world, just talking about veterinary practice in general, where we're starting to call it something called contextualized care. But that comes back to the same idea that the right care for an animal is the veterinary or medical care that is appropriate for it in the context it's in. There is no what is often termed gold standard. There is no best veterinary treatment. The best treatment is the one that's right for that animal at that time in that context. Um, because it can be real ethical, um, some of this conflict that the others might have talked about can come from the vet side and they want to do what they would do to a, a client's animal. They want to do that to this animal in a shelter, but they, there's resource constraints or various other contextual constraints that mean they can't. And that can pose real ethical conundrums for some people. So, yeah, I really I can put the um, ref in the, in the chat later, if you like. But, yeah, the contextualized care versus gold standard paper is a really good one to look at. There was I'm going to probably narrow it down to two major fantastic things about this work that I believe are crucial and exciting and I will personally be taking forward into to my work with charitable organizations in the future and those are around the importance of having clarity of an ethical stance within an organization and I'm massively excited about it the idea of setting up an ethics board within an organization too so those are the two main things that I want to talk about about that was that I've really taken from the piece of work this idea of having clarity of ethical stance within an organization is so crucial and I've got to say I mean it's an incredibly rare undertaking I think what is most exciting about this book is that it happened at all that these discussions happened at all, that this project happened, and then it's all been written down and shared with us as a way of saying, look, this is something that we can do. And it's something I would love to see taken forward, these, even if it's just these discussions, these ideas being brought up within charitable organizations. The reason it's important to understand what an organization's ethical position is, is because in my experience of working within organizations, it's, it's very rare for them to know what their position is. They couldn't articulate it and it will often change and flow depending on the issue, which is where these conflicts and problems can come in, because I'll just go with whatever perspective seems to fit right then, rather than having an idea of what might be cohesive for them. Another reason it's really important is it helps stop mission drift. And I've, again, I've seen this in many organizations where you have who your beneficiaries are. And by the way, the beneficiaries are always the animals, not the people that you're helping. It's always the animals. But that can so easily, unbelievably easily be lost when you have the competing pressures of resource um, limitations, fundraising in particular and marketing can put a lot of pressure on the kind of messaging that might go out there or the kind of things that that might go on in an organization that might twist it and change it from from the mission that it's actually at an example of this is um the species difference say between dogs and cats and and the welfare of, of living in a shelter for example one organization might keep 
might have animals that they can work as sponsor animals. Those animals live there in a sanctuary situation and those animals can make a lot of money for the organization. However, you transpose that to a different species whose welfare is, is not okay when they're kept in a sanctuary situation. But the fundraising, for example, might put a lot of pressure on saying, let's keep just some of these animals and we will make an awful lot of fundraising money off them as, as sponsor animals and we can help so many more. It's a straight utilitarian argument. But if an organization values each individual animal as having its own moral worth, they cannot do that. They cannot sacrifice some animals for the greater good in that kind of way. They cannot put some animals to suffer. But not having clarity on what position the organization's in means that those kind of conflicts can very easily arise. Um, what else can I say about that? Yeah, and again, as I, as I mentioned about that charity jigsaw, if an organization is clear about its ethical positioning and, and where it puts itself, that makes it easier for staff, for um, donators to find their space, to find their place where they're going to fit, where they want to give their money to, where they want to work. And again, that's going to help reduce some of that conflict that we see. This point about ethics boards that I'm most excited about, it's something that we've been having very early discussions of in some organizations that I work with um, in a consultancy um, perspective. Um, but I've seen it even just, so not even with formal boards, but just the power of even just one aspect of what an ethics board could do, the idea of retrospective case discussions. If you can go over and talk about in an open space instead of an ethics rounds kind of way over a case that was really difficult for people, you know, something that dragged on, ended up in a bad euthanasia, all these things that really create horrendous staff drama. If these can be discussed and talked about and learned from and moved ahead from next time, it can have incredibly powerful aspects. And so really does that kind of discussion happen. Obviously, the idea of having really brave forward planning, discussing difficult decision making before people are put into those situations is incredibly powerful. And that's going to have such a, a huge impact. So, yeah, I mean, I think obviously the way the positioning, those central questions that Angie put up before, um, and they were really brave about the way that this project was approached. They thought, right, we're going to we're going to push the positioning perhaps from the feedback, we're gonna push the positioning of the SPCA into, you know, to be honest, a more rights sort of perspective. And we're gonna try and make that congruent and coherent across everything that they do. And I really, really um, applaud that. I think that's, that's a really brave and exciting movement to do. But there are a couple of issues that the volume raised for me, just a couple of points I'd like to raise that I'd be really interested to take forward into future projects like this. The first thing that really stuck out for me, I suppose, especially coming from the center, central questions, things like what the animals should be fed and terminating of healthy pregnancies and um, about community cats and TNR and rehoming kind of questions, is that there is welfare science around a lot of these things. And there's perhaps for me, I'd like to see maybe a bit more of the evidence base that exists sort of woven through some of these decision making and some of these some of these tools. Um, and really, that just comes from, you know, a wide collaboration on a project like this, which I think this project that has happened has set us up, many of us who work in the industry have set us up to go ahead and do, to increase the participation in the, the initial project, to make sure that there's animal welfare scientists, you know, welfare veterinarians, behaviorists, um, perhaps health psychologists, I'll come to that in a minute, to be involved with, with how things can go forward. In particular, I think one thing that stood out for me was some of the assumptions that were made in the book about, about the state of an animal in a certain situation is that animal welfare assessment is such a crucial thing. Now, those of you who work in the shelter industry will know that we don't have great <laughs> assessment, welfare assessment tools for shelters. They are coming. It's going to be something that people are really interested in working on. But it's absolutely crucial because we can't always assume that just because we've saved an animal and it's under human care, that it in any way has good welfare at that time. We need to be able to evidence that. Because actually what we do know is that for a lot of animals, and I'm going to say something fairly contentious here, shelter equals suffering. Shelters are horrible, horrible places to be for animals. 
the experience for them, and I'm talking welfare here, so not ethics, not what we think and feel about it, but welfare, their experience of their day to day, it's awful for them. That can vary obviously between individual, it does vary between species into how well we can care for them. And that was approached in the book, especially talking about exotics and certain species for whom we may not be ever able to make environments that are acceptable. But I mean, I'd argue the same, I've worked a lot in cat shelters. There's, yeah, there's, I couldn't say that there's a cat that enjoys or has a good life in a shelter. And I would say there's a majority of cats who are suffering in that environment. And it's a very difficult thing. So we often like to think of it because we don't like to think of it because we're saving them, we're helping them, we're looking to the future. And I would argue, and I know there's a discussion in, in the book about this, but that they're not, that they're experiencing their here and now in the round. And if it's bad, it, we need to limit that suffering as much as we possibly can. I think the book sort of focused on pain as, as an aspect of suffering. And of course, that's really important. But I think maybe it missed a few of the, you know, suffering is a much bigger thing than pain or physical health. Um, obviously, the mental experience of fear, depression, anxiety, stress, and really extreme stress are really prevalent in the shelter environment. And these are really, really crucial. Leading from that as well, there wasn't really much mention of the disease risk um, within the shelter environment, which again is a really big thing. And the point that made me think about that was where it was talking about stocking and the resource issue. Because the SPCA has this open admissions policy and the difficulty of that, there may be times when the pressure to take in means that they might go above this, their ideal stocking rate. Um, and this is purely from a personal perspective as someone who has dealt with very bad parvo outbreaks and shelters. The idea of pushing that stocking density scares me a lot. It's it can have, I mean, obviously the individual animals might be feeling a bit more cramped. That's not the problem. The disease risk is astronomical. The welfare consequences can be astronomical. We can, you know, hundreds and hundreds of animals can die in horrible ways. And these are some really important bits. Just a few minutes left. Okay, I'll finish up. Um, Yes, I'll finish up with this. So yeah, the only other thing I'd like to say is that um, obviously the book positions it as, or positions the role of the SPCA here as, as more of a rights view. And that's, I think, really, really to be applauded. Um, I would like to take the opportunity to again, implore for this idea of the charity jigsaw and the idea that a, a organization that puts itself in the rights view is brilliant that doesn't mean it's the only view. There are other ways that charitable organizations can operate and do a lot of good, and they could be under a more utilitarian banner and do that. And I think that can be a real positive, as I say, because of you know, the fitting of staff and the fitting of, of donations as well. And I think it's important as well, while it's so nice, we all want to be cohesive in our ethical positioning. We all want to not be hypocrites. That is the ideal. When it comes to animals, and when it comes to animal ethics, avoiding hypocrisy is incredibly difficult. And I, I liked that in the book, there was this discussion of the fact that because the SPCA has to operate in these different contexts and have a position on farmed animals and companion animals in these different contexts, that for a period of time at least, a transitionary period, they may have to accept having different, different positions on those while they, they work towards another. And I think that acceptance of... of different positions is something that that is quite important I think a bit of understanding between organizations and within organizations of those pressures is is really crucial because how humans feel about different animals is while we want to be cohesive or we want to be coherent relational ethics and the Peter Sandow relational ethics kind of way that sort of to be really trite with it animals matter when they matter to us kind of way we can't get past it. It's illogical, it's speciesist, it's all of those things. But it is how the public work and it is how we work. And there's sort of, there are neuroscience reasons for that. But we do have to live within that world where that kind of relational ethics exists. And I think if we want to take people along with us, while it's good to have clarity of a position, I think we want to look outside and look at how we can increase dialogue as well and, and acceptance of people's different views.
Um, there's one other aspect of UK charities I didn't bring up that's become a really big thing here, which I don't know if such a big thing in North America, but human behavior change. It comes from health psychology literature. And it's, it's a real big movement in, in animal welfare over here. How do we get people to understand and listen to us? Because one thing we know is they don't listen to evidence when we just bash them over the head. They don't listen to us when they, or they don't change rather, when we just say this is how it should be for animals. What we need to find is, is better ways of communicating and better ways of bringing people along with us. I think I'll leave it there. I think it's probably time for a bit of a drink and we'll really look forward to some discussion afterwards. Thanks, Karen. Thanks very much for those comments. Um, and it's really interesting to hear more about the UK sector, which I should probably know more about. Um, OK, so as Karen said, we're just going to take a quick 10 minute break. So we will resume at 14 minutes past five and then we'll hear from Jess and Laurie. Okay, I think uh, I think everyone's sort of coming back from from the brief break, so we're going to move on to our next two speakers, starting with uh, Jessica. Okay, so I would like to start by just congratulating everyone. Oh, sorry, I don't think we can hear you. Okay, I think you're back. Okay, yeah, sorry, it keeps saying the host muted you. So <laughs> um, I'm not sure what was happening there. Anyway, it doesn't matter, I'm back. Um, so I wanted to just begin by congratulating everybody involved in the production of this book. I think it's a truly wonderful and very important book. And um, just to give you a sense of how wonderful and important I, I, I think it is, I'll just share a very short story with you. So when Angie first wrote to me about participating in this event, I was extremely stressed. I was trying desperately to manage a whole bunch of work commitments. I was preparing to move house. I was um, in, engaged in an epic battle with Canadian immigration. Um, and so while I really wanted to participate, I was really concerned that I wasn't going to have enough time to read 
enough of the book, let alone the entire book, um, in sufficient depth to have anything interesting to say at this event. But Angie reassured me that, um, you know, I, I didn't need to comment on everything. And so I agreed to participate. And um, when the book arrived on my doorstep, I thought I would quickly just dip into the introductory chapter. And it did not take long at all for me to be completely reeled in. And I, I read the whole book in a record time for me and some of the parts even twice. So it really is a wonderful, wonderful volume and congratulations. Um, I'm gonna use the rest of my time today to firstly just share with you some uh, general impressions of mine of the book as a whole. And then I'm going to focus on one chapter in particular. And I should say from the outset that that chapter that I'm focusing on is one that I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, I just had a couple of questions about it, perhaps just a, a desire for some further clarification. Um, and perhaps that was just because it was something that I had been thinking about a bit as well. So yeah, okay. So to begin with, um, I think this, this volume really does achieve what it sets out to achieve. So it captures so many of the complexities of the circumstances in which animal shelters operate. I think it renders really plain the range of very difficult ethical decisions that uh, people who work in animal shelters are constantly forced to make. And what's really wonderful about the book is that it, it does all of these things with an aim to making things better. So each chapter um, is about a particular ethical issue or range of ethical issues that is that it sort of comes up in the context of of animal shelters and then it offers guidance which is extraordinarily nuanced and practicable but at the same time extremely aspirational and so the book to me is very clearly the product of a very close collaboration between animal ethicists and people who work on the ground in animal shelters. And it makes very clear why we need so many more of these kinds of collaborations, not just in the context of animal ethics, I think in philosophy much more generally. Um, I think the collaboration is really helpful and wonderful. Every chapter is also written beautifully, um, which if you read a lot of philosophy, it's, it's not often that you read a book that that every chapter is really wonderfully written. Um, they are all clear and appropriately concise, but also rich and, and extremely compelling. And while the introduction says that the target audience for this book is people who work in animal shelters, I think there's so much in it for so many other people, um, and not just people who are interested in the ethics of animal shelters. So I've been thinking a lot lately about um, the use of of animals in health related research. And so much of what many of the contributors to this volume had to say has helped me to think a lot more deeply about my own project. So in particular, and this Angie mentioned at the outset is this, this recurring theme of this distinction between ideal and non-ideal theory. And this recognition that while it's really very important to have a vision of a of a truly just society in mind, it's equally important to acknowledge the very difficult and non-ideal circumstances in which um, we are operating. You know, the, the real world is such that it's not always possible to achieve that in you know one one giant leap. Um, and so, in our work, it's so important that we convey this vision of of a truly just society, but at the same time provide some kind of roadmap for how we get from where we are um, to this truly just society. So we provide a, you know, some smaller time bound goals that we really need to set about achieving along, along the way. And so that was really helpful as well. And also this idea that, you know, even though we're often forced to move a bit more slowly or, or perhaps a lot more slowly than we'd like um, towards that ideal, moving slower, but but in a steady way is often the surest way that we have to achieving that kind of um, much more just society. And, and it's not as we're often led to believe to be selling out. So that was a really important message that I think came out in, in this volume. Um, so now a few more specific comments about a particular chapter. And um, just to say, to preface my comments, philosophers are well known to be 
critical, sometimes overly critical. And as I read through this volume, I was struck by how few critical comments I actually had. And so again, my th this part of, of my sort of brief uh, commentary is more just a, a series of questions about a, a one chapter in particular, and that's chapter two, the chapter written by um, Angie, uh, titled Caring in Non-Ideal Conditions, Animal Rescue Organizations and Morally Justified Killing. So um, perhaps just for everyone's benefit, I'm not sure if everyone's read all of the chapters or um, any of the chapters, but I'll just briefly summarize uh, the relevant parts of Angie's, Angie's argument. Um, so in this chapter, Angie sets about um, answering the need for greater conceptual clarity regarding the use of the term euthanasia in the context of animal shelters. And to do this, she begins by arguing that non-human animals have a strong prima facie right not to be killed by humans. And non-human animals have this right because they have, or they almost always have an interest in continuing to exist. And because this interest is a fundamental one and a significant one, it is appropriately protected by a right. And what this means is that when animals do in fact have an interest in continuing to exist, when humans kill them, we are infringing or violating that right, and so we are wronging them. And Angie then considers what this means for shelter workers who, because of the very tragic situation or the circumstances in which they're working, are often forced to kill non-human animals who do have an interest in continuing to exist. And in Angie's view, um, although shelter workers are usually fully morally justified when they kill these animals, those animals are nonetheless wronged. But very importantly, in Angie's view, the animals are not wronged by the shelter workers themselves. Um, she takes the shelter workers to be doing what is in fact in the best interest of those animals, given the very tragic uh, circumstances in which uh, they and the shelter workers find themselves. Um, she thinks they're in fact wronged by the state. And this is because the state is essentially failing to provide animal shelters and so the animals in those shelters with the appropriate kinds of support. Um, and then Angie goes on to say that this question of responsibility for the wrong doesn't actually stop there. So because we're well aware that at least for the foreseeable future, um, the state is going to continue to fail to provide appropriate kinds of support. Um, all members, each and every one of us who's a part of the political community in which those animal shelters operate, in fact, has an obligation to join with all other members of the communities and do something about this state of affairs um, to petition the government or whatever else it may take um, to, to ensure that animal shelters and so the animals in those shelters get the adequate kinds of, of support. So uh, there are a couple of questions I had about your argument, Angie, um, and I'll just, I'll just share two here. So the first is um, just regarding your first claim that when it comes to the wrong, it's, it's the state that wrongs um, the animals. And I think, I, I wonder perhaps whether that's a little bit too quick. It's, it's so easy to blame the state for so many things. And I'm, I'm entirely sympathetic with your claim that the state bears huge responsibility for the wrong done. And I'm entirely with you that uh, the animal shelter workers are not responsible for the wrong done to those animals. But I wonder whether it's, it's sort of too quick to just leave out certain individual humans who also bear a lot of responsibility for that wrong. And I'm, I'm just thinking, for example, of people who are involved in puppy mills or whatever else may be. Um, I would hate for them to think that they escape, you know, culpability for, for their actions. Um, so that, that's just one thing. And, and perhaps you try and capture them later on in your argument um, when you're talking about uh, you know, the community. But I, I do think perhaps it's worth mentioning earlier on that, you know, these people along with the state are, are culpable. Um, and then the second thing, uh, I, 
I, I'm very sympathetic and I find it deeply compelling to think that each of us in the political community has a responsibility to do something about this particular um, gross injustice. Um, I just am also wondering, however, whether it makes a lot of sense to think, given the range of very serious injustices that almost all political communities face all of the time, whether it makes sense to think that each and every one of us has an obligation to do something about each and every one of those injustices. Um, so I, I completely think that there's a shared responsibility within the political community to do something. I just, I guess I'm wondering whether the appropriate or the, the, the most uh, pragmatic or, or strategic way of divvying up that shared responsibility is by allocating a equal responsibility to each and every member of the political community to do something about each and every injustice, including that to animals. And I guess I'm, I'm raising it also because of a theme that you mentioned about not wanting to to alienate people that you know may may be very helpful in coming to the to the party to actually um, to to make the changes that we want. And if 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 what we're requiring is is striking people as overly demanding or unrealistic, I just I just wonder whether it's counterproductive. Um, yeah. So those those are just my comments. I hope I haven't misunderstood your argument or misconstrued it any way. I thought it was a wonderful chapter really got me thinking about a lot of things. Um, so yeah, maybe later on in, in this, uh, we can we can chat further about that, but thank you very much. Thanks so much, Jess, especially knowing now what else you have going on. It's uh, really appreciate you taking the time <laughs> to, uh, to read the book and, um, and to write these, these super helpful comments. Um, okay, great. So also give Andy a bit of time to think about this. <laughs> Uh, we'll move on to um, final commentator, which is Laurie. Hi, um, I hope you can hear me. Um, thank you so much for this remarkable book. I just have to commend everybody who's participated in it. It is, um, as Jess just said, and others have said already, such a rich book um, and hope it will make a uh, meaningful and helpful intervention, not just um, at the SPCA, but in general um, or more broadly. Um, it is, I think, in so many ways, a model of ethical engagement that I hope is more widely emulated. And by that, what I mean is it's starting at the ground up and trying to deal with the kind of messy particularities that are so important in so much of the ethical space that we operate in. And in it sort of adopts um, a certain kind of openness to incompleteness and um, in, in a somewhat, uh, you know, uh, understated way, we'll say, um, kind of pushes back against the desire for a universalization that's so much a part of philosophical ethical work um, that tends not to have either motivating power or actual accuracy in dealing with real ethical problems on the ground in the world and is also full of so many implicit biases. Um, so I really just want to congratulate, um, as others have already done, everybody who is involved in doing it. I also have to say, and I'll say more about this in my brief comments, it's a really brave book. I, as I said a little earlier before we started, um, I've tended to avoid um, writing about uh, sort of companion animal ethics for a long while, because I think it's really uh, such a difficult area of conversation um, and so I'll talk a little bit about some of the sort of historical and personal reasons why I've avoided that in my work. Um, but basically what I want to do is just highlight four topics that came out for me in thinking about and reading through this marvelous book. Um, some of them are going to be also contentious, um, the issues that I raised, they're going to be um, critical challenges, but I hope that the critical challenges are taken with the spirit of understanding how admirable and exciting and groundbreaking and brave and um, I, and with great respect for all of you who put this together. Um, so the four issues I want to I want to talk about some more 
sort of quickly than others includes feeding dogs vegan food, which is, I mean, that it's going to be very quick, but also um, not particularly philosophical. But then the idea of killing for non-euthanasia reasons is going to be, is one of the issues that I have um, and I think we've all, we've just talked just just talked about that. Andy's chapter is terrific. The whole discussion is really complicated, um, but I want to talk a little bit about that. I also want to talk a little bit about workers' epistemic positions and participation in decisions. Going um, back to the idea of the staff drama, and uh, share a little bit um, about my experiences in that regard. And then finally, an issue that doesn't really get taken up, but is really important, I think, increasingly in shelter spaces, and that's the connection between shelters and carceral apparatus in terms of policing, prisons, animal crimes, holding animals, and those kinds of questions. And that's a topic that uh, I've been working on for a while, and a colleague and I, I have um, been writing a lot uh, about. So, um, okay, just very briefly, let me say a few things about the vegan food question. Um, it's a hard question. Um, and I just wanted to mention a particular set of issues that have been troubling me for a while. Um, it used to be that people would argue, people in the move in the animal protection movements more generally, people who are in animal ethics who are um, advocate veganism, that cats could be vegan. I've always found this is a really challenging um, kind of experimentation on animals that I don't know is ultimately justified. Um, there's tended to be this idea, and this comes through in the book a lot, that dogs can health, can be healthy and vegan. That's not so much the case. And I think it's really important for those of us who work in animal ethics to be up on some of the empirical data. Just a couple of weeks ago, a colleague of mine who's on the board of a farmed animal sanctuary that I sometimes do work with, um, was emailing me in hysterics. Her dog died last year, and she just discovered that the reason that her dog died was because um, she was raising the dog was vegan. And um, there is this thing called dilated cardiomyopathy that impacts dogs. You may have heard about it around four and a half years ago, maybe five years ago now. It started to become a really big issue, and people were worried about the, it being grain free. Um, dog food. And so there was all this research on grain feed free dog food and worries about pea protein and sweet potatoes and pulses. Maybe this was causing this um, DCM, is that what they call it in the literature, dilated cardiomyopathy. It basically causes heart failure. Um, the evidence has suggested um, that no, it's not grain free diets per se, but it may very well be a certain percentage of plant protein without animal protein. Um, and so at just a couple months ago at Guelph, they did a study with very small sample. I don't actually like the conditions of the study, but that's a whole nother matter. Um, but in any event, they did a study to determine whether or not pea protein was the problem. They found it wasn't the problem, but it wasn't vegan food that they were doing the study with. They were There was chicken in the food. So the, the I think there's really an open question, and they were using dogs in that study who aren't the typical dogs that end up getting DCM. Um, those tend to be retrievers in much higher percentages rather than um, huskies. And they were um, doing this nutritional work both in a non-vegan way and with the uh, uh, breed of animal, breed of dog that don't get sick. So anyway, the only point that I wanna, I wanna make here is that um, we need to be really careful in making ethical comments about what it is that we think is healthy or unhealthy as philosophers. <laughs> we don't um, perhaps have the best handle on that. Um, obviously, there's vested interests from the pet food industry, which is deeply ingrained in indus industrial agriculture um, and the use of animal bodies. But I just did want to flag that particular note it throughout the volume, um, it does seem that there's an idea that it's a not those are non tragic um, options. But if you do feed animal dogs in shelters, vegan um, food with um, high pulse protein, that may lead to our early death for those animals. So I did want to just flag that not a philosophical issue, more of an empirical issue, but something to be mindful of. Okay, so the second issue that I wanted to talk about, um, and this is obviously an issue that the contributors um, were so thoughtful about um, in the volume about how contentious this issue is, I completely agree that um, the idea of 
ending an animal's life, um, should we should be much more specific about what when it's euthanasia for um, end of life concerns when an animal is going to die um, to minimize their pain and suffering and doing that form of euthanasia versus the idea of killing an animal um, who would otherwise have a reasonably um, good life. Um, I want to just say a little bit personally that I haven't ever said before, but I think I will say it in this context. Um, part of the reason I find this topic so challenging is that a really long time ago when People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals was just starting, I was working there. It was just four of us. Um, and Ingrid Newkirk sent me off with a nurse friend of hers um, to Delaware. This is over 35 years ago now, um, but it stays with me. Um, to an animal shelter that was using a decompression chamber to kill animals. And um, obviously there were much more humane ways of killing the animals. And so our task was to go to the shelter to advocate and show them how to do lethal injections. I was really young um, and the killing of this healthy Samoyan who had one brown eye and one blue eye with a lethal injection, a perfectly healthy young dog was so traumatic for me um, at that moment um, that it, uh, it became kind of common around PETA as we were growing at the time that we can't talk about killing and death with Lori, she's too sensitive. Um, it was a really challenging experience. And what I wanna say about it is that it was total, I mean, whether that dog was going to die, either a horrible death in a decompression chamber or a pain free or relatively pain free death by the lethal injection that I gave this dog. Um, but this was, I mean, as I say, decades and decades ago, but it's still really, really um, hard to think about for me. And so this is going to be um, connected to the third point I want to make about decision making within the shelter um, space. But this idea that somehow um, it is not my fault or somehow I'm not to blame or I'm not responsible, this doesn't track for me. Um, again, I understand fully that I am um, I did something that was creating less harm. And if I were a utilitarian, which actually at the time I was, but that's a whole nother story, um, that, that I would feel okay about it. But I don't, um, I don't know that that's something that I can say, okay, it's not really my responsibility. It's either the state's responsibility or the shelter's responsibility or somebody else's responsibility. It very much felt um, to me and continues decades later to me to feel as though I certainly did bring that dog's life to an end. Um, I wanted to just then turn um, after sharing that to um, a couple of points that I wanted to make about the implications of justifying um, killings. And then this will also tie back to um, both of the earlier discussions from Karen and Sophie about ethics boards. So um, again, I'm going to say something a little bit more um, sort of autobiographical as it were, but I've been working for a number of years and I'm writing a book now about, um, about zoos, but I've been working for a number of years um, with the World Association, or was working with the World Association of Zoos and Aquaria and also the ethics um, committee of the um, AZA, the American um, Association of Zoos and Aquarium. And um, one of the things that I was doing uh, a few years back was serving on an ethics board to try to revamp uh, the sort of ethics, the code of ethics for the World Association of Zoos and Aquaria. And one of the things that was a real sticking point was euthanasia of zoo animals. Um, it is actually a quite common experience, even though you might not think of it if you're not in this world you, that, that zoos kill animals, um, particularly in European zoos. It's what Mark Beckoff has called zoothanasia. It's really quite a common occurrence. And most recently, a couple of years back, in the Edinburgh Zoo, some of you may have heard about Madili, a 10-year-old chimpanzee who was moved from the Copenhagen Zoo to the Edinburgh Zoo because he couldn't be integrated into a group at the 
Copenhagen Zoo. Now, Copenhagen Zoo, you may remember, is also a zoo that killed Marius the giraffe and fed Marius the giraffe to a group of lions, and then the lions were killed later. Um, and anyway, there was a, so the, these zoos are are actually doing a lot of what we would call um, non euthanasia killing, right? That in 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 this sense that they call it euthanasia, but it's actually the kind of um, killing that um, is discussed in the book. And so one of the things that um, worried me is that this so when Medelli went from Copenhagen to Edinburgh um, they couldn't integrate him into the group of chimpanzees that they had there these were allegedly um, experts in chimpanzee behavior I have some questions about that but in any event they decided that it was best for him and best for the other chimpanzees to kill this 10 year old endangered chimpanzee um, and that justification in many ways tracks some of the justifications for killing that are in the book. And I just wanted to raise a worry and concern um, about the sort of ways in which the justification in the context of the non-ideal situation that we have in animal shelters may sort of travel, as it were, to other captive institutions and other captive spaces. And I think that that is um, a terrifically important thing to be considering. Um, it is also, um, I think, another, I, I just wanted to sort of follow up on earlier conversations. It's also raises really tricky questions about these ethics boards. And so, um, my experience in uh, the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums Ethics Board, or board de designed to determine the code of ethics, they would not talk about um, not doing euthanasia. They would not talk about taking an animal that's in a zoo and moving that animal to a sanctuary, for example. That was not on the table, and it was not something um, that they wanted to address. So this raises a question, which is kind of a corollary as, as it were of the question of euthanasia, what to do when there's disagreements in an ethics board. I think ethics boards are really important. I think that ethics, ethics pe tra people who are trained to do um, philosophical ethics and practical ethics like many of us are, um, have much to contribute to these conversations, but it raises a different level of kind of meta-ethical concern. What happens when our when we really believe that what is being endorsed by the organization on whose ethics board we serve um, is not going in the directions that we think are justifiable? And I ended up resigning in protest over the killing of Medili um, because I realized I couldn't. Um, continue to work on that ethics board. I think that is going to be particularly tricky um, in these more community-based settings. And so I just want to raise that worry about ethics boards and particularly these really vexed, contentious issues about when and whether killing might be justified. I want to raise one other worry and then about the killing part and then to other um, concerns, as I mentioned. And that is the kind of ableism that might be implicit in these decisions to kill healthy animals or healthy anim animals that don't, their lives are not ready to end, um, but who may be difficult, may have psychological um, problems, um, those kinds of things. And I do worry about um, the idea, again, and this is a worry about tra the, the notion of justification traveling um, in um, how we think about whether and under what conditions taking a life may be justified given the non-ideal conditions in which we find ourselves. So those are just um, a lot of, I think, uh, issues around killing that I hope we can talk a little bit more about um, when I finish. Um, and I want to just make two other comments about um, the stress of decision making, um, how to think about workers' epistemic positions, and how um, important it is to care for the caregivers. Um, again, in my own experience working at, um, not employed, but working with, I should say, uh, Chimp Sanctuary, um, the largest chimp sanctuary in the world, Chimp Haven in 
uh, the US and Louisiana. Um, one of the things that it became so vivid um, to me in my working with this organization is how, and this happens in shelters as well, is how um, when someone dies, uh, when an animal dies, when an animal is killed, you don't get any time to mourn or grieve. Um, you just go back right, right back to work. And I do really worry about how um, care for caregivers can happen. Um, I also was I'm really worried about how to think about decisions to end life um, or decisions to move an animal or decisions about adoption or decisions about any number of things um, that caregivers, how they're participating in these decisions. And one of the ways that I think is really important um, of thinking about this is not necessarily that one needs to develop a consensus model of decision making, but certainly um, there needs to be a careful discussion about how that decision uh, how those decisions are made. And I would suggest and urge that participatory democracy um, in the fullest sense be um, attempted um, in these contexts, particularly in light of the fact that so many um, caregivers in its facilities of all sorts um, end up having to sort of hold in a lot of the grief and sadness um, and maybe even anger that they feel. And so ultimately to bring them into, everyone into the decision-making process may be a way of avoiding what I think what um, Karen was mentioning, uh, this, this staff drama, the drama that can be very, very intense. Okay, finally, I just wanted to mention um, if I may, some of these issues around um, connections between shelters and sort of carceral apparatus of the state um, and how to be thinking about those concerns. Um, again, this is not something, I mean, it's it's sort of mentioned a few times in the volume, but it's not something that's really taken up in um, any deep way, but I got the sense at least um, that there are animals in the shelter who are there because there's court proceedings that are um, carrying on. And so there are evidence, quote unquote, in those proceedings. Um, and that there's some also connection between the police and the, uh, the, um, the shelter. And I just wanted to raise a couple of really profound concerns about that connection. And I'm gonna do it by way of a story um, that came out in my work um, with Justin Marceau, and um, we have a volume out on carceral logics um, that is about a particular individual um, in Dallas, Texas, um, whose name is, was, is Maria Flores. And I want to just tell a little bit of the story to highlight one of the real, uh, let's say, conflicts that can emerge between shelters and the community in which um, those shelters are, or the communities that those shelters imagine themselves serving. So in Dallas, um, Maria Flores brought her Maltese dog to a veterinarian. Um, he had been limping um, and um, the veterinarian suggested that the problem was that the, um, the dog wasn't groomed properly. And as a result, there was matting that was causing um, muscle deterioration in a back leg and that the, um, the treatment would possibly be or probably likely be amputation of the back leg. Um, the dog would be fine, but that this problem had persisted for so long and it would cost about $1,500 to $1,800. Um, Maria Flores didn't have the funds to take care of Muffy, the dog, um, in that way. So maybe Muffy was a girl and not a boy. Sorry, I think I said he. Anyway, um, Muffy um, was then on, um, after Maria brought Muffy home to the family, the children said goodbye to Muffy and she brought um, Muffy to the local shelter. Um, the local shelter then recognized that Muffy was in bad shape and needed medical intervention, but called the police um, and, and on Maria Flores 
Um, and she was arrested um, for animal cruelty and neglect and put in prison where she stayed for a, a month without her family. Um, and Muffy had her leg amputated and was adopted. So Muffy was doing fine. But um, Ms. Flores ended up in really awful situation in which she, as I said, was in prison or in jail for about a month. And then when the case, they decided not to further the charges against, um, against her, um, that's when um, DNS came in. That's when um, immigration services came in. Um, she was here in the US in Texas without proper papers and they were about to then deport her. Um, and her family had been here, they live here, they were working, they were employed. Um, all of this is um, one of the real concerns that I've had and my colleagues have had about these carceral connections between shelters and the kind of carceral apparatus that really can harm people as well and communities. And then the side effects of that are going to harm the animals themselves because obviously people in, in Maria Flores's community are not going to go to seek out care or services if either veterinarians or shelters are reporting to police and other um, authorities that would lead to um, a real disruption in their well-being. And so many dogs and cats and other animals will presumably not get the care they need because people will be afraid of the link between the shelter and the state. Um, and so I did want to just raise that as a concern. There's a lot more I can say about that particular concern. Um, but I do think it's a part of the ethics of animal shelters um, that wasn't covered, but may need to be a further project down the road. And I'll end there. Thank you so much, Laurie, for, for your comments and insights and also for sharing some of these um, personal stories. Really appreciate it. Um, so I think next on the agenda is another 10 minute break. Am I remembering that correctly? Okay, great. So we'll take another 10 minute break and then we'll come back and start opening up the discussion. Thank you again to all the commentators for now. Am I a minute early? <laughs> Did I jump the gun? <laughs> Uh, oh, no, there you go. <laughs> Three minutes past. Um, okay, so the remainder of our time, um, what we're going to do is first see if any of the um, volume contributors have any comments um, that they want to make in response to those raised earlier in the session um, before opening it up to a general Q and A. Um, so I put in the chat box <laughs> if any uh, contributors have any comments to raise their hands. Um, so far, I see no hands raised. <laughs> so um, I'm guessing that maybe I will <laughs> start um, to respond to some of the points um, made by the commentators. So um, where to start? I'm going to start with Jess because it's was most targeted on my paper, um, but actually with a view to saying something in response to Karen. Um, so you're completely right um, that there is a, a way in which what I've written kind of comes off as sounding like you know, the state bears the full responsibility for all of the wrong here. And individuals who might also have, you know, wrong particular animals sort of drop out of the picture. Um, and I don't want that to be um, the consequence of my argument, but I do think that the state bears responsibility for the distributive injustice, and it's particularly the distributive injustice which is causing the problem um, that shelter workers are facing um, in their everyday uh, decision making about who gets to live and who has to die. 
Um, so I agree with you and there should be more said about all of those people who are engaged um, in these activities uh, and who also sort of as individuals harm animals, but that wasn't quite, I guess, the focus of uh, of what where I was, you know, of what I was trying to do. Um, so that's one thing, and I guess that the question about our responsibility, since the state is not doing its bit, right? Then it looks like we have a responsibility to do something about this um, structural, um, the structural problems, to make the state. Uh, do something to satisfy its duties of justice to the animals. And I guess like one other thing just to say about the state is that, of course, the state is allowing, right, or um, creating the conditions such that people have lots of companion animals, um, that it, you know, perhaps fails to prevent puppy mills, for example. So, you know, the state is implicated in those ways as well. But just in insofar as the state fails should we really think that each of us has or bears a responsibility and what does that really amount to and I think that you know there are just difficult questions about what as individuals we you know as an individual have an obligation to do right like how exactly you kind of cash that duty out but nonetheless right it seems like there is some responsibility there and at the very bare minimum and I think that this is what was motivating me when I wrote that chapter seems to me that particularly in the UK uh, and Karen touched on this with regard to um, our tabloid media, there's a lot of vilification of shelters uh, and shelter workers when it transpires that some animal was killed for non-euthanasia reasons. And so at the very least, I think that the public has a responsibility to recognise, right, that this thing that they're so outraged about, right, is partly right a, a, a kind of a shared responsibility that no one really gets off scot free. Um, that you don't get to point the finger uh, and blame those who are already right desperately trying to do right by animals. So I think that you know that's sort of the the bigger picture um, and what's motivating me there. Um, and I guess that. So just one last thing on this, thinking about Laurie's comments. I think that it's really difficult. But the thing that I was most struck by in interviews with um, the employees at the Montreal SPCA is just how heartbreaking the work is um, and how just routinely sort of disappointing and dejecting and but the grief, the sort of daily grief at having to make these decisions and the guilt that accompanies that, right, I think is problematic when you really break down what's going on. It's not obvious to me, the, the guilt makes sense when you think about the, the tragedy of the situation and it makes sense that you would have all of those sort of reactive attitudes to what's going on um and in a way it would be we would find it problematic if a person didn't have those kinds of attitudes right um but nonetheless i think it's wrong to place responsibility for the wrong on the shoulders of the shelter workers the reason why they feel that they have those kinds of emotional responses is because of the causal proximity that they are in to the wrong that's done not that they are the wrongdoers and so that fra the framework that kind of advanced in that chapter is really trying to capture that. Um, and I can, when I presented this to the shelter workers, some people were like you, Laurie. It's like, no, I just feel like there's something that I'm doing that's wrong. Whereas others felt like, no, this is right. That actually um, the responsibility for this needs to be shared more widely. So I think that you can sort of see where the, uh, the benefits of the framework are. I mean, one thing that's worth probably saying is that it doesn't absolve shelter workers of their responsibilities to those animals in general. But the thing is, they're already doing so much, right? I mean, that's the important thing. They're already working so hard um, to avoid, you know, um, killing animals for non-euthanasia reasons. They're already working so hard to rescue animals. So they're already discharging their duties. They're already fulfilling their part of the bargain. Uh, and so I think that 
any the, the guilt uh, that one might feel at performing those actions, whilst it's understandable, I don't think it really does track something about the moral wrongdoing that those individuals um, are, are committing in any way. Um, so I'm going to be quiet there because that's enough about me and killing, I think. Oh, one last thing, just, just back to Karen though. A large part of what you said, Karen, was that um, it's really about charity, right? So how we should, you know, we, we live in societies in which animal protection organisations are propped up by charitable donations. And I think that for me, and this kind of goes back to this idea of the role of the state, we need to shift away from thinking about this as being about charity. And we need to stop thinking about individuals, you know, giving money uh, and charities vying, right, competing with one another to take um, money out of people's purses. Really, it is about justice. Um, and even if you don't want to think in rights terms, we might think that there's something important about the entitlements of animals that can't just be left to the charitable whims uh, of individual um, donators. So, uh, it, I mean, that doesn't take away from the facts on the ground, right? Like that is how the sector is. But I think that, you know, in a way we should worry about that, right? The general structure of what's going on and thinking only about um, rescuing animals or protecting animals as a as a charitable uh, responsibility as opposed to something which is uh, really the responsibility of the state and the community um, but yeah I'll just be quiet now has anyone else got any other comments that they or responses Karen just on that last point, you, it's so right. I mean, and the extreme, I think, of that idea that somehow charities have to do this work is prosecutions. I mean, the RSPCA here and the same, and you talked about the SPCA there, being involved in prosecuting laws that exist, that are there. Why is a charity spending charitable funds to bring those prosecutions when it obviously should be the police doing it? I mean, that's that when you really start to look at it, it's absolutely extreme, but so many people in the public and you know jurisdictions accept that as yes it should be you know charitable money that that pays for these prosecutions but it's it's absolutely madness really so yeah I really take your point there that in the same way that even caring for these animals when it's a societal problem why again should that be a, a charitable thing rather than a public duty yeah good anyone else Kristen yeah, so I just wanted to say something quickly on um, Laurie's point and the story of the, um, the the local woman who was prosecuted by police and then actually uh, deported, because this is something that also I think came, but it's kind of broader issue that I think comes up in the shelter context, which is the sort of, I mean, we focus a lot on the fact that there, you know, shelters are operating within contexts where animals, uh, moral standing isn't taken seriously. Um, and that's sort of something that um, shelters and animal protection organizations have to um, navigate. But at the same time, there's other kinds of injustice that shelters are also operating in. And at the very least that they don't want to uh, exacerbate that often still might be become implicated in. So one of the issues um, that came up as, as we were working on, on the book was this question of, you know, shelters operating often in sort of being localized in in um, marginalized communities and the surrender rates being higher among disadvantaged groups, low income groups, because they can't pay for vet fees or because they're not able to find reasonably priced accommodation that will allow them to bring their um, companion animals and so on. So often being at much higher risk of having to surrender. And so, I mean, one way, one context where this come up, come up was in the context of Valerie's and my chapter on questions around adoption, what kind of criteria are applied to people who might want to adopt an animal where tradition, there has been this kind of concern that the kinds of criteria that are being used to, or in the past were used to sort of um, weed out certain applicants were connected to how much, effectively how much money people have. So I think this is sort of, I mean, you know, as we're moving, I think as we're sort of thinking about different directions of the project, I think this is something that we need to tackle 
uh, more heads on. And obviously, Laurie, the, the story you told was, I think, a much more extreme version of <laughs> the, the sort of issue that we uh, we were thinking about. And I think it's something that comes from, I mean, in the story you told, the shelter kind of reported the um, the person to the police because you know they they brought in the animal they brought the animal in in this position. Um, but also, I think there is a kind of growing recognition among shelter workers that they are operating in this context where they might be implicated in social injustice um, and where are they kind of positioned in the context um, of social, you know, vast social inequality and that they don't want to uh, make things worse and that can also shape their, their policy. So I think this is something that I think you it was, it was fantastic that you brought this up and brought this up with such a... Um, striking um, uh, account of how this might might play out in practice and certainly something that I think we need to think about much more uh, explicitly. So thank you. Uh, Laurie, did you want to say something in response? Yeah, just um, just very quickly. I mean, I think there, there's, a, at least in the US, there is a really understandable idea that when people do terrible things to animals, something should happen, some intervention should happen. So I guess I just want to highlight that obviously I feel as though that's exactly right. Something should happen. But I think there are other, there are all alternatives to the carceral framework that can come into play. And some of us are working on these ideas and it would be I, wonderful to work with, with people who are involved in shelters um, to try to develop um, different ways of creating alternative. Now, there are some people, obviously, who are just bloody cruel to animals, but there are so many people like Maria Flores or like many of the people who I've watched who end up in hoarding situations totally innocently and by accident. And so anyway, I just think that there's a lot of really cool and interesting ways of going um, in that direction, working together with both animal control, who's um, folks who are doing, many of whom are doing really important work as an alternative to incarceration or getting caught up in, in the criminal legal system. So I think there's a lot of space there for great work. Okay, so nobody's got their hand up. So I'm just gonna say one more thing and then we'll move on to Ken. Um, so I was thinking, Laurie, you were right about um, the implications of uh, the non-euthanasia killing justification for zoos. I think, I mean, one of the reasons I'm sort of reluctant here is because I think that the two kinds of organizations, right, are very different insofar as it seems likely to me that even in a perfectly just society, we might have animal shelters, right, but we wouldn't have zoos. And I sort of wonder about, so it's true that for both entities in, in the here and now, right? We're operating in the non-ideal. Um, but I there's something about the very foundation, right? The very justification for zoos in the first place, which I think makes it hard um to to wield that kind of the kind of argument I've got in mind in that case. Um but I, I mean I take the point, but I just know I'm not really sure like how to think about um whether it is something that could be naturally extended to um, zoos as a potential justification for killing, given that arguably the animals shouldn't be there in the first place. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't have any more thoughts on that. Just the general observation that they t seem like two very different kinds of organisation, one which has a, sort of, to my mind at least, inherently unjust um, foundation and the other that does not. Um, okay. Okay, Ken. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for presenting today. I think everybody did a wonderful job and uh, uh, look forward to reading the book. It's the first I heard of it, so I'm uh, going to be interested in this. Um, one thing um, that I want to comment on, and then I have a question, um, is um, when it comes to looking at the state's responsibility in euthanasia in shelters, and I think that so much of um, the state's responsibility is influenced by other industries such as animal agriculture and clinical veterinarian um, settings that um, it's hard for shelters to kind of have that 
ethical um, setting where, um, you know, they can say, this is what we want to look at when we decide, uh, you know, when to euthanize an animal without crossing paths with when other industries want to make that decision. So I think for shelters, it's, it's, it, you almost have to tiptoe around what other industries are prominently doing and is being accepted in the States, whether it's in regulations and legislation or um, just codes of practice. So I just think that's one thing that needs to be considered when um, you wanna look at you know, a, a person who technically is doing the euthanasia and then you know, saying that it's you know, an influence of the state. Um, the state bears a lot of responsibility in, you know, from, from my experience in, in what happens in those scenarios. And it's not necessary from the influence of, um, you know, animal control and, and sheltering and rescuing. So just wanted to comment on that. And um, the question that I have is um, it, that it, there's so much from other industries um, it, it, um, pressure on, um, you know, kind of what comes out into the public realm and, and what doesn't. And I think that, um, people working in shelters often don't have the ability to express what is ethical and you know from their concerns um, due to that uh, pressure from the vet industry from animal agriculture and it, so within a vet in, uh, within a shelter environment I'm just wondering how it is that all people who are working there um, get that opportunity to make sure that their opinion is heard or their voice is heard because a lot of times they're the ones actually experiencing the the moment um, by doing the euthanasia or having to decide the euthanasia so I'm just wondering if anybody has any insight on that thank you thanks um does somebody else want to talk Kristen yeah, so I think, thank you, Ken, for, for the question. So I think the, so I have to say, I found this one of the really difficult things in, you know, because this is one of the big issues we were just talking about as, uh, as we were talking to the SPCA and as we were sort of trying to write up our own recommendations was this broader question of how, how to position oneself towards um, animal industries in a context where you want to take a very clear stance against those industries, but then there is also a concern that, you know, if as an organization, you um, take a more cooperative stance, you might, so that there is a question about whether or not there, a more cooperative stance could actually help achieve more um, positive outcomes for the animals um in those industries and this is something we discussed very much because this is all this is kind of a practical question that that very much came up in the discussion and in the recommendations we we took a more the our position the position we recommended was to remain to kind of forego the the whatever benefits might be attached to the cooperative stance to more cooperative position and just take a very clear stance that you know if you're concerned about animals and you know you're an animal protection organization then there is just you know you, you have to be critical of industries that you know kill animals exploit animals um for, for various reasons so there's you know um that's that's what we recommended uh and part, so part of our reasoning was that it just need there needs to be a clear position that helps to that challenges this, this idea that somehow cats and dogs are different from pigs and, and cows. And, you know, that these are just sort of completely different moral questions. And we thought that, you know, any kind of position that tries to build bridges with the animal industry is going to undermine the organization's ability to really take that moral position and to challenge some of people's um, conceptions about that. So that's kind of the position that we, uh, that we recommended um, in in our uh, yeah that's what kind of what we recommended, but I think there is there is a concern certainly for for people on the ground that they do feel that there are benefits to uh, a more cooperative position and 
yeah, so this is something that we we discussed and we felt in the end that there was so much uncertainty around what you could actually achieve by working with industry and there might be all sorts of ways that you might think you're achieving something, but actually ultimately you're just sort of um, rubber stamping things that they want to, you know, sell to the public as, you know, ethical, more ethical treatment of animals and so on. So we, in the end, um, didn't think that there was something to be pursued. Um, yeah, but it, it was something that we discussed in a lot of uh, detail and we tried to be very sensitive to, you know, try and find some nuance uh, there because it's not a straightforward issue. I mean, I think that just to add to that, that in general, shelters are under all kinds of pressure from competing stakeholders that, and it makes it really difficult to, to, to do what they're committed to. Um, and this comes back to like, you know, just being clear about what your sort of ethical framework is. That ethical framework that we kind of, you know, teased out of the documents for the Montreal SPCA is really quite radical um, comparative to like how the actual world works. And so that instantly puts you at odds with a lot of the practices um, that are pervasive in our societies. And so th there is a real question about how you how sheltering organizations pursue and stay true to their mission statement while also having to operate in a in a world in which that that mission statement itself is very radical right and actually upsets people um and is likely to detract people uh, or funders are likely to you know be upset by those um, principles and commitments and it can have a knock-on effect for the efficacy of the organization so this is always operating in the background when dealing with any of these like controversial um, topics. Um, and I think that the quite point that you raised about sort of transparency is just really interesting. I think that um, at least my experience of the sector in general, like it's just not very transparent and you can understand why, right? Um, it's very, the saying the wrong thing can, comes with sig significant costs, right? And so it's better to just say nothing at all and to not engage in these kinds of projects because it might have terrible, terrible, terrible ramification for your organization. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think we're all agreed that we need more of this. Um, but I think for the organizations themselves, it's a huge leap of faith um, that they could engage in this kind of work and not and not suffer really negative consequences. And so there are lots of issues around transparency, which, I mean, I'm not really sure like how we deal with them in the future, but um, you can understand why there's a lack of transparency. Um, Karen, was that on this point? Sort of, it is, but um, I was after Mara, but yeah, I suppose, okay. it, yeah. It was it was just to raise the question based on what um, Kristen was saying, kind of what you're saying there as well about this idea of taking a stance against animal use and trying to be cohesive with that. I just wonder in, a, in the course of the discussions when working on the book and working on the project, was the use of companion animals discussed? Because this sort of is compared as if farmed animals is a use and companion animals are not, but they are. And I mean, sometimes really explicitly, if we talk about therapy, su emotional support, you know, there's an absolute wealth of animals out there that are these species that are explicitly used, but even just companion use. And I, I'm always very wary, having worked a lot in companion animal welfare, that there seems to be an assumption that because we have an emotional attachment to them, somehow their lives are better. And that's not always the case. Um, their lives, we can cause significant welfare compromise by our love. Um, so I just wondered if that came up in discussions when, because there seems to be this sort of binary use of animals this is not use of animals but it's maybe not as binary as it seems so i took it yeah go on. we didn't discuss that but that's a very good point thank you <laughs> yeah no so i think that's right that it didn't come up i mean i think that uh there probably is an assumption um that there's some kind of morally uh permissible form of animal human companionship right that that there's nothing in fundamentally right at odds um with 
uh, keeping animals and realizing justice in our relations with them. Um, but that is something that one could question. Um, uh, but I guess that the, at least insofar as we are in the here and now, <laughs> people do uh, love their companions, or many people love their companions. Um, it's does yeah yeah I'm not sure I'm not, I'm the wrong person to ask on this. <laughs> um, but yeah I think that we didn't talk about it enough um, and it would be interesting to see whether it made a difference to how you think about some of the more long-term aspirational proposals uh, Mara thank you this is such a fascinating discussion and I just wanted to add a few comments as a US-based shelter consultant and as a former shelter director herself um, it, it's so interesting that I found out about this book. I haven't read it yet. I look forward to it, but I've been grappling with these same problems in my consulting work recently, and I've been writing reports just strongly encouraging these individual organizations that don't know each other, but are having the same systemic issues that they need to develop a baseline value system. And, you know, we can start from that simple point of, you know, there is intrinsic value to animal life. Let, let's just start there because, you know, as you know, these shelters are very uh, disorganized environments. They're very chaotic. And speaking as someone who took over a shelter and who was put in charge of, um, you know, dramatically lowering the euthanasia rate, I was successful at that. I was uh, very unprepared for the complex ethical decision making. And what I think is a really good point to acknowledge, and this is what informs my work now, um, when I work with these shelters that have, you know, very, they don't have any stances established, but they're still working from a very different, you know, like moral framework. If they're euthanizing 80% of their population, that's a different framework than I had when I was euthanizing only maybe 5%. But, um, when when you're dealing with the on the ground pressures and it's and you don't have a value system there's so much cognitive dissonance involved in that and you know if you are caring for certain animals and then today that animal's life matters to you but tomorrow based on you know resource pressures it could be a lack of kennel space then you have to behave as if that life doesn't matter today and euthanize that you know there there has to be some sort of moral injury component to this and i felt it i didn't have that vocabulary at the time but i just find all of this so fascinating and the the idea of ethics boards and ethics rounds I love it. I hadn't thought of that before. And it's it's very, very much necessary. I, I just I wonder what you're what it's going to look like, hopefully, when this comes to fruition, despite all of these people involved who are having trouble making decisions because of the confusion and the emotional dysregulation that comes with not having that baseline value system. I don't know. I just, I wanted to, you know, issue that comment and kind of validate some of those observations and um, just hear your perspectives on what you think the next steps are. I can say a couple of things about this and then um, anyone else should feel free to chip in. So thank you very much, Maya. This is really interesting to 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 hear your perspective. And I have to say, I'm really pleased that you find it useful to the idea of having an actual framework in place. Um, we, I mean, we spent a lot of time thinking about this, and we so as, as Angie explained earlier, we didn't want to impose um, a framework. So we we um, took a lot of from the documentation that already existed, where a lot of values are kind of explicitly or implicitly. Um, um, adopted and you know there, there was a commitment to certain values that was already there and we tried to um take that as as our starting point um but i guess there is a there is an extent to which we were i mean we were trying to extract but also to kind of make more systematic what was already there and to use that in in building the recommendations now one difficulty is that if you even if you have a set of values in place, it doesn't necessarily, and I think this is already coming up in the discussion, that doesn't necessarily mean that there is no no disagreement about what the 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 upshot of those uh, values is going to be in particular circumstances. So, um, 
I think the having the the um, the value system in place can help with the kind of cognitive dissonance that you described, but also it's important that there was still is still going to be um, disagreement. Um, but I mean, you know, as philosophers always like to think that having a system in place means you can have a more, you know, be clearer about where your disagreement actually is, for example, and um, that it can help have a better discussion. That and when a decision is made, that it can reflect the different commitments that um, people might have. So I think I'm pleased to hear that you like the idea of a value system. And I, I, I think, you know, that, that, that you would find it different as, as a practitioner, I think is, is, is great. So I find that um, I'd like to chat more about that. The other thing, so I think it's, it, so it's interesting to me that there's several people have mentioned the idea of an ethics board and the idea of, of, sort of ethics rounds. And I think the one, so I've, I've, you know, I've worked in medical schools and I've sort of worked on sort of public health ethics and medical ethics. And one thing that I think is that one really striking difference that is very unhelpful, I think, in the shelter context is that veterinary, veterinary medicine, and maybe this is changing from what Karen is saying, but it doesn't really, doesn't seem to have a conception of ethics as non-medical in the way that we do in human medicine, right? You wouldn't, you know, if you're talking about, you know, a, an issue in, in, in medicine that's sort of a, clearly an issue of medical ethics, like end of life care, you go to an ethicist, you go to a medical ethicist. And certainly I've been involved in ethics rounds in hospitals where cases were discussed, where there was a clear recognition that this was not a medical question, it was an ethical question that required kind of collaboration between people with different areas of expertise. And that kind of collaboration and division of labor does not seem to be happening at all in the kind of veterinary context. Um, even when we're talking about shelter medicine, there, there just seems to be um, very little. And what, it, what happens as a result is this, you know, this, this sort of overburdening of people who work in shelters, but there's just no real um, sense that you know, there, there is a sort of people with ethical um, you know, you think about ethics, who, whose job it is to, to, to have answers to certain questions. And so, I, yeah, I find, it how, I find it interesting and helpful that this is sort of an idea, that the idea of an ethics board and ethics rounds is something, I mean, we have clear models from the human context that we can, that we can use. So this seems like a, a kind of um, fairly straightforward thing to, to implement in different contexts. Now, in principle, now the problem is that you need people who can actually <laughs> fulfill those roles, which is not going to be straightforward. But I think we have a we have a we have a model um, of of how to do it from the human context. So I think that might help. But yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mara, for, for those comments and questions. So I think that on that last point though, then we get Laurie's concern from it about really politics and power within the context of an ethics board, right? So there do need to be there are questions there about how uh, such a board is put together um, and how um, decision making takes place and who holds the power when ultimately you know, a decision must take place. So, yeah, I mean, this is, I guess, all the stuff for <laughs> that needs more work, um, but it's important to keep in mind. Um, uh, one last thing, just in response to Mara, um, and I think that it comes back to Karen's thought. So, uh, Mara said that uh, she liked this idea that there might just be a basic claim that all shelters could get on board with, such as animals have intrinsic value or something like that. But as Karen pointed out, depending on like the mission statement of an organisation, that, that claim might not even be there. And so there are, I think, interesting questions are really about, I mean, we're just a really sort of practical exercise of trying to help organisations get clear on like what the ethical underpinnings are of the organization um, and to see you know what the uh, what what such a framework would look like for organizations flying under a utilitarian banner for example um, but that's just a, a point of curiosity on my part um, okay uh, any more questions no everybody happy Okay, great. Um, well, thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, I think we've had like a really 
good conversation. Uh, and I think I feel, yeah, I'm encouraged that so many people turned up and that the book seems useful uh, and that there's, I think, a lot of opportunity for more work further down the line. So hopefully we'll be able to pursue some of the stuff that we've discussed today. Um, would any of either of my co-editors like to say anything to sign off? Yeah, so just a couple of things. So one is that, so I'm really happy so many people showed up today and we invite everyone to, you know, if you have an interest in this topic, if you work in a shelter or um, work in this this area, or obviously if you're a philosopher, you know, feel free to, to write to any of us. Um, I think, well, our email addresses are easy to find, so just look up our names. Um, and I'd also like to thank again, Laura, Laurie, Jessica, Karen, and Sophie for their comments today. I think it was really, really helpful to kind of have a recap a little bit and also hear from people who work in very um, different contexts. Um, so it was very useful for us and thank you for taking the time. <clears throat> and then I, I'll just kind of at a very last thank you um, to just want to reiterate how grateful we are to the Montreal SPCA uh, for all the time that they took to talk to us and express to us some very difficult, often um, <clears throat> scenarios <clears throat> scenarios that they've dealt with. We know that that wasn't always easy, and we know that they spend a lot of time and energy that is already at very that is already very uh, short disposal um, in the this area of work that they spend a lot of time and energy talking to us and answering our questions and we are extremely grateful for that and uh, we hope that we can continue working uh, with, with you at the SPCA. Okay, that was okay. it for me. Okay. <laughs> now we do that weird thing where we leave Zoom. <laughs> I don't forget. Okay, all right, well it was nice to meet you all <laughs> and um, may I pass across again in the future. Bye. Bye everyone, thank you.